Father Robert is back from CES and he brought us some gadgets. Jeremy Burge from Emojipedia is here to tell us all the emoji news that we need to know right now and how to hack a bird scooter. Also, the twit switch is back and Jason and I talk about our first week's experience with each other's devices. All that and more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 66, recorded Thursday, January 17th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly CDN. Be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Find the right people for your business this year at linkedin.com slash technews and get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. I am Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. Getting to the news, uh, there's nothing <laughs> to see here. No, actually, wait a minute. Uh, there's someone sitting in between there us. There was no empty desk. So they'd like, just sit here. I'm like, all right. Yeah, so. we, we figured we couldn't find an office for you to work in. So if you don't mind working between us, Father Robert Balassare. It's uh, the best place to be, really. And and we'll just do the show and pretend you're not okay. here. Okay. If, oh, too if maybe Burke could grab me a sandwich. <laughs> I'll be down with that. How are you doing, Father? I am good. It's, it's great it's, to see it's you. nice to be back from Rome. Yeah. Um, uh, Rome is very interesting, but I, I, I am. <laughs> is Rome home? No. Yeah, no, it is. It, oh, Rome, yeah, your assignment is always home. Rome yeah. is my home, but I very much enjoy coming back to the States. Oh, well, we very much enjoy having you back in the studio. Even if it really meant I had to, to come you. back to CES. I mean, that was crazy. But yeah. You Did didn't you, have to do that. You could have come anyway. I could have come anyway, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's there's something different about doing CES when you don't have a schedule to follow. When you, mm. you're, you're yeah. literally just roaming the holes for yourself. It's a different experience. Not even at CES, you can't escape Rome. You're roaming the halls there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, dad jokes. Sorry. I miss the dad jokes. We yeah, don't get many know. dad jokes. You know what Rome. I got for Christmas? I actually got a, a book of dad jokes. Pretty awesome. My, my wife knows me well. You know, or I'm sorry, Kevin Santa Claus knows book, me well. Which is strange. He's not even a dad. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's hilarious. Let me tell you. I'll bring it to the studio sometime and make you guys laugh. I miss and you grow. guys, by the way. Yeah, I miss, I miss, you, I miss too. you so much. My goodness. I was, you, you're always welcome to come visit and stay as long as you want. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm on, I'm, honestly, we will take you up on that. I mean, we only have uh, 162 guest rooms, so... <laughs> Could so we could I, take our pick, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, why are you here? Well, the Consumer Electronics Show, that's why. Right. Well, at least why you're in the area. You you did get to go to the Consumer Electronics Show. It was last week's news, essentially, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about it because you probably got a bunch of stuff sprawled out on this table that maybe we haven't talked about on the show already. So you got to experience the conference in a looser sense, you got to kind of wander around aimlessly. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, and see what you see and, and and enjoy it in your own special way. So what did you kind of walk away with? Well, I mean, all three of us have had that experience of going to a conference where you have like 10 appointments and you have to hit those appointments. Yeah. Very different from when you just go in and you say, well, what's interesting? What what do I like? What catches my eye? Um, and I was really able to do, the, do that at this CES. I just looked for the tech that actually applied to me that I was interested in. I found a couple of trends. Let's start with some of the trends. Okay. Uh, first is um, AI. AI is huge. And not like AI last year. AI was a buzzword last year. Everyone threw in AI. I have an AI-enabled toaster or an AI-enabled blender. Yeah, it kind of started to lose its meaning. It really because did. Because everything right? had AI and really at the, at, you know, at the core of it, oh, you mean yeah. there's an algorithm. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, even, even to the point where you're like, why do you need AI in that? There's no reason to right. have an AI bath controller. Uh, you know, you, you want an automated bath controller. An AI-infused toothbrush. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, you, actually, that, actually, that does exist. That was a yes. product there. I <laughs> would want my bath to know um, and learn, <laughs> and then... Um, I want that my was bath. too hot. Yeah. 
She screamed because it burned her. <laughs> Next time, yeah. I'll make it cooler. Or an AI-controlled bidet. I mean, who doesn't want the, the toilet to guess when you're done, right? I mean, Wait a minute. What? Seriously? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I am very serious. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's the Toto Watch. Oh, they're a sponsor of Twit. Oh, so. uh, yeah. Okay. I, I will say... Um, I want that. I mean, seriously, if they are sending uh, samples, I want a sample of that. I would love wow. that toilet. Because right now I'm stuck with the European bidet, which is next to the toilet. And I never understood getting up. I just yeah. use it as a drinking fountain. This is so much more efficient. <laughs> you did not. I like the cover they have for over the bidet. That's, and that's production. That stays on there. Because they don't oh. want you to they actually you to mess sprayed. up the oh. toilet, right? Because, I mean, it's expensive. No, yeah. Yeah. no but seriously, uh, talking about AI, um, what I saw now was there's this big push, not just a, the, the standard AI fields where you have AI facial recognition or AI voice recognition. Uh, there, It's playing into what I'm calling the death of social media, at least the death of social media as we know it. Because remember that Blockbuster report and then the subsequent reports about how the, the viewer counts are bogus and the, mm -hmm. the online influence numbers are bogus. Well, advertisers are, are starting to take note. And more than any governmental pressure or more than any doing the right thing, Tech companies in social media are starting to recognize advertisers are going to walk away if we can't prove to them that we actually have the pull that we say we have. And the biggest developments in AI have been noticing those patterns. So I, I'm thinking you're going to start to see a practical application of AI in social media. And I, it, I mean, I hate to say it. That's probably what's going to hit its stride. Mm. So, so what do you have there? I see the Yubico, the Yubikey. Yes. Did you get? Is that the one for the iPhone? Uh, yes. Well, they have a couple. So they've got one that's NFC enabled. This is their uh, their USB C, but they have one that's USB C on one side and Lightning, lightning. on the other. So when your iPhone gets USB C, you can still use Precisely. it. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Now, for those people who aren't uh, uh, familiar with the Yubico uh, uh, process, essentially you put a impossible to break hash on this key. It's a it's a security key and you can then tie it to different accounts. I have it tied to my Google account, to my Twitter account, to my Google Plus account, to uh, <laughs> you know Facebook. RIP. Exactly. Almost. So so you can only access those those accounts when you have this physically connected to the device. And now it works on my laptop, it works on my desktop, and it works on my mobile, which Yubico recognized is a huge shortcoming because how mm -hmm. many of us lock down our laptops and our desktops, but our mobile devices, it's its like, it's literally just a face print or a thumbprint, and now you have access to everything. No, but face, face print, thumbprint, I mean, those are impossible to break. There's no way to trick <laughs> I know, a face right? print camera with like a picture of someone's exactly. face. That just doesn't happen. And, and actually, I'm using a phone right now that has, they did that. They sped up the facial <laughs> yes. recognition by reducing the complexity, so now you can hold a picture up to it. Well, actually, I, th I think I read there was a, yeah. a study done very recently that basically said like 60% of all facial recognition can be tricked with a photograph. But you Absolutely. were pointing to your iPad there, and face ID cannot be tricked. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Oh, oh, okay. No, switch. face ID is perfect. <laughs> We've just stumbled into the switch debate like this. <laughs> Save um, it. All right, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh, here's, here's one I actually really enjoy. Um, we've all played with wireless quote unquote wireless power, right? Because it's, it's typically, it's the chi, it's uh, the contact charging where you put it onto a charging pad and you don't actually have to physically connect a cable. Well, I've always wondered, and a lot of people have wondered, since Tesla did wireless power so long ago, why don't we have it? Well, we do, it just hasn't ever really been successfully packaged. Now there's a company called Powercast and they've created this. This is sort of the commercial version of their, uh, of their industrial unit. They do this large three to five watt transmitter that you can put and have anything powered within 20 feet. This transmitter can go within about three to five feet. So these, these don't have any batteries on them. What, what, what is that buzzing? Oh, uh, sorry, that, that's actually this because it is transmitting at 915 megahertz. So oh, it's, okay. it's the frequency, if you hold that, oh, you, okay. you can get one. Oh, so look, it gets, gets far enough away and, and then it stops? Right, so it will, it's also the polarity of the antenna. So if I turn it the right way, uh, okay, you're, I'm lit. You're lit. I'm I'm, I'm lit I'm right lit. now, you guys. Lit. There you go. I am not lit. Wait, wait, hold on. Uh, wait, wait. There we go. So I you, have to, you have to match AF polarities. Right now. Wait, wait. There you, there you I go. am lit. Uh, now you're lit. Now you're lit. Now the idea is you could take this this technology and you could embed it into things like key fobs, remote controls, smoke alarms, anything that doesn't require constant power that might come within range of one of these transmitters during the day. So imagine that never going dead. Wow, that, that is really cool. It's actually kind of cool. I mean, there are no batteries on those sticks. The only thing on that stick is what they call the RF harvester. It's a little, uh, an IC 
See, and, and notice how I can make it light up d depending on how uh, how uh, I turn these. It's okay. super directional. It's super directional and it's super polar. So, um, and and this is kind of beginning stages. I have to imagine at some point, you know, we we've often dreamed about walking into a room that's equipped with some oh, sort yeah. of wireless charging for our phones so that we never have to plug it in. It's just kind of charging while we're in within Precisely. range, right? Precisely. Is this kind of the baby step to get there? This is absolutely the baby step. And I mean, think of all those applications like video game controllers or keyboards or mice where we like wireless, we just don't like occasionally having to change the batteries or yeah. recharge them. Well, this could always be recharging as long as it comes within range of one of these transmitters. It's very promising tech. Now, they are already FCC approved. They probably should go through the FDA. That's at what some I was going to say. Is that dangerous to my yeah, brain? Right. For I mean, example, it shouldn't be. It's, it is the same frequency as RFID, and that frequency it's relatively low, 915 megahertz. Mm -hmm. So it's not ionizing. It doesn't penetrate as you saw. It really doesn't penetrate. In fact, it's super short distance. Yeah, very short. But it doesn't require physical contact, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I like that a lot. Very neato. Um, what uh, what is the D free? <laughs> okay. And why, why are we talking about the bladder? Uh, bladder is important. It's part yeah, of the body. True. Very important part of the body. Okay, now, I, <laughs> if you watch Twit this Sunday, you saw me actually wearing this during the show. Mm. There's an app on my phone, and it works on Android or iOS. This is actually a, an ultrasonic transducer. Um, and it goes on your abdomen, over your bladder, and it actually transmits the, how, much, how much of the, your bladder's volume is currently being occupied. Whoa. Okay, now, okay, Okay. bear with me, because I know that sounds silly. Here you go. I'll it kind of sounds like video but game But are there like. people that can't really feel that? Absolutely. Yeah. So they created this originally for, like, nursing homes and hospitals. Okay. okay. And they all transmit back to a central nursing station. So the nurse knows, oh, this patient should go and this patient should go. And it's an alternative to wearing a diapers. That's why it's called mm -hmm. D-free or catheters. Mm -hmm. But they realize there's actually, there's actually a market with private citizens, those who are not yet in a nursing home or a hospital, I know people, people who are my loved ones, friends and family, who as they've gone older, they cannot sense when their mm -hmm. bladder's getting full until it's mm -hmm. too late. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is actually a warning. It's super accurate. It tells you on your phone how, how, what percentage of your bladder is full. Now, they do have an API for this. So I want to see if I can join it with uh, Google Maps, because Google Maps has a listing of oh, all restrooms. Going. Right? Yes. So imagine being able to take the percentage <laughs> full, and it tells you you're not going to make it to the next rest stop. Or this is the last. Or tell me before that. Yeah. This <laughs> tell is me the, before that. This is the last clean rest stop coming <laughs> right. up within your bladder range. We advise you use That's this good. restroom We're right now. Like a Tesla charging station. Hey, exactly. This yes. is a, a supercharger for your bladder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, you know, I, at first I wanted to make fun of it, and now I realize we well, all no. we all need one of these attached to us. Uh, obviously, yeah. they could do something uh, along the lines of miniaturizing this uh, even further. Yeah. But still, they they for, probably should turn it into some sort of belt. Uh, oh, thing, right. That, this is designed to be attached with medical tape. Yeah. Um, and, you know. Incredibly useful, It's right? actually very useful. Yeah. Uh, they had That's another neat. another ultrasonic product at uh, CES. I wanted to get it uh, $2,000, so no thanks. But it would hook up to your iPhone or your Android, and it's actually an ultrasound. You could, like, put it on your chest and see your heart beating. Wow. Um, which is cool. I just can't really justify $2,000 for cool. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was from Butterfly. Oh, let's talk about some health tech. Okay. Um, do either of you have hearing problems? Hmm? Not yet. I, I'm starting to have them, and uh, I dove into this market not too long ago. Are you I, talking right now? I, I can't. <sighs> I see your mouth. I, 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 you have a video of your, you're getting cleaned, so I remember that. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's not go there. Okay, anyways. Uh, so I was doing some uh, hearing aid shopping for, uh, for a parent, and I was outraged at how expensive those things are those they're, they're huge yeah uh, and uh they're kind of ugly so this is actually the ergo this is their neo it comes in a pair so you have both left and right they're bluetooth connected so that you can set them up they last all day about 18 hours on a full charge plus this is actually the, the case slash charger we'll keep it charged for a week um, now if you go back to the wide shot the cool thing is once you insert this so it's on i haven't configured oh, it at all wow and i'm sitting like i'm, I'm sitting like, right. I should be able to see this like popping out of your ear, and all I see is this tiny little, little plastic tail. or something. Um, yeah, the tail. Yeah, and this is actually it's how very you, this is how you change the setting. So right now it's set for uh, as loud as it can possibly get. It's now mm. program one, program two, program three. <laughs> that is really so. Interesting. Your head is now a controller. Someone finally found a good use for this thing. Mm. 
Yeah. That is fascinating. And then, it, and so I, I would imagine some of these things, you put them in and it would be really hard to get them out as, as they miniaturize these things further and further so that they blend in, which right. is what you want. I just do this. Uh, but Whoop. I mean, it has this tiny little antenna that you really have to look for to find, but that also acts as kind of like an easy to grab handle. It's funny that you bring that up because I am uber paranoid about something slipping into my ear canal. Yeah. Um, I I don't like IFBs. I've learned to use them, but I hate putting anything yeah, in my it ear. it feels weird. That's it really cool. Yeah, and they look look so cute. Yeah, it is nice. And how does oh. this this charges with USB? Uh, yeah, that's just USB C. Mm. So uh, yeah, USB C charger. It actually charges. You can go from dead to completely full on those hearing aids within about thirty minutes. Now they start at fourteen hundred dollars. This particular one goes up to twenty five fifty. So they are expensive, but that's actually cheaper than what you would get from from the current crop of of hearing aids. So this is sort of health tech. That's neat. And, and I'm, I'm such a, a big fan of health tech. Such a big improvement over what we're used to seeing with hearing aids. Yeah. Uh, computers, gaming accessories. I know yes. v VR, you were tweeting about this stuff okay, while you were there. So for the next year, if you're looking for a laptop, there's two keywords. The first is the Intel i7-8750. That is a CPU beast. That's what you want. It's got really good thermal performance compared to performance of, uh, of the CPU itself. The other is the NVIDIA RTX 2060 or 2080. That's going to be in every gaming high-performance notebook that you have hmm. from here on out. And we saw a, a, a wonderful plethora of notebooks at CES. Acer, Dell, Alienware, uh, MSI, Asus, Lenovo, they have all got those same, those same chips. In fact, they're all going to be showing that you that demo you're seeing right there. That's the only demo that NVIDIA would allow manufacturers to show because... The specs on the chip aren't super, super finalized yet. By the way, this is the Acer Tri Predator Triton 500. I love this thing. Starts at $1,800. It's that same CPU. It's the G RTX 2060, 512 gigabytes of RAID 0 SSD, 16 gigabytes of memory, up expandable to 32. That's a 15.6-inch IPS screen, 1080p, and the thing only weighs 4.6 pounds. I mean, if you're looking for a gaming notebook, that thing is pretty much perfect at mm. a great price point. They've got another one, the uh, Predator 900, which is the uber crazy one. That thing is $4,000, but it has a 4K touchscreen. It's got the 2080 for its graphics part, a terabyte of RAID 0 SSD, 32 gigabytes of memory, and one of those easel screens so you can move it anywhere you need. So, yeah, gaming notebooks this year, um, I am so glad that I waited because there's, there's a great crop. I mean, if, if you want Razer, if you want Dell, no matter what style you get, you're going to get something that's so much higher performing than even just four months ago. Is that headset for gaming that you've got there? Yes. So this is the this is the Plantronics. This is their 500 rig Pro. It's uh, it's only 90 bucks. It's, it's supposed to be more or less bare bones, but it really is designed for the gamer. You've got this all aluminum band. It's super lightweight. It's actually very comfortable. You've got this dual material cup. This is a, a removable mic, but also it auto mutes when you do this. Mm, uh, and, nice. and noise cancels because no one, you know, if you're gaming, you don't want your curses to be... Um, muted out by Echo. Oh. And, and, you know, it's, I, I love this. Actually, I, I know that both of us, we really like the the Plantronics, the, mm -hmm. the Backbeat, or the Blackbeat Pro. Mm -hmm. That thing is incredible. This is sort of taking the design cues from that Blackbeat and turning it into a gaming rig. Uh, not bad. That's not bad nice. At all. Yeah. Again, about 90 bucks. And the sound is pretty good. Sound is good. I mean, it really is designed for gamers. So, they, mm -hmm. I mean, it's 50 millimeter drivers. Um, you know, it's, it, it's comfortable. It's, it, that's what they really had to focus on. Not mm -hmm. that it has 100% audiophile co quality, but that it's comfortable enough for you to do a, a gaming session. And are those available now? Available now. Everything, everything on this table is available now, by the oh. way. So you can, you, I, I brought nothing home. Actually, I did bring a few things home that you can't get, but I, I didn't bring them into the studio. Uh, by the way, this is kind of cool. Um, is it you, a button? It's a button. Okay. But it's a super cool button. Okay. Uh, so it's just an LED light. Uh, no, we've seen these before with the LumQ, but a lot of those LED lights, they're the wrong color temperature for video because they're about 7,400 Kelvin. This is 5,700 Kelvin. So it's really close to daylight. And it just gives you this nice soft. See, notice how there's like no harsh shadows. Mm -hmm. There's no harsh edges. You don't get that with a, a standard LED light. Uh, this is the Lytra 2.0. It's $90. You can get it right now on Amazon. Lasts for four hours on a charge. And I got to say, I mean, I've been looking for something this small that, that's, that's this good and like this high quality. I mean, look at that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, oh, and I can, I can actually turn it up. Oh, ah! Okay. okay, you weren't even at full, to, full blast that. there. Uh, and cool. yeah, this is, this is one of the first piece of tech that I saw at the show. 
And I got to say, um, I, I like it. I'm, I, I, I got to bring home some practical tech. So that was my first piece of practical tech. Looks like you have one more thing there. Uh, one more thing. Well, yeah, SSDs. Love SSDs. I'm, I'm going to be playing with these forever. But I did want to show you this. Oh, by the way, these are Kingston's. This is this is what you get if you do, you do CES for a, a long, long time. Kingston starts sending you home with two terabyte SSDs. So, yeah. no big deal. No big deal. Just just saying. But, humble uh, brag. I'll, I'll give this give this to you, Megan. Is it water? It's it's water. But uh, it's lucky. <laughs> Perfect water. It's a special kind of water. It's from a company called Zero Mass. The product's called the source. It's Can a I hydro it? panel. Uh, sure, it's okay. No, talk about it before I drink it. Well, okay. So um, <laughs> they've designed a completely motionless, partless, <laughs> stateless water generation system. It, it uses little solar panels about this size. Uh, uses the heat from the sun to sort of um, to, to superheat the air, which actually increases the uh, the humidity. And then they use, oh my gosh, Jason here. She's like, here, let me wait, open wait, that for wait, you. Wait, Jason. Oh, uh, 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 oh, there you go. He You're welcome. You. That's, that's, that's for you. Uh, can uh, I drink it? Yeah. Uh, th th this is actually from it's one of their vodka? hydro panels. <laughs> it kind of looks like it's vodka. It does, right? But it's, it's even Ooh. fogged out. No, but um, so. I got my lipstick all over it. Each one of those panels <laughs> can generate 18 liters of water a month. So you put enough of those panels, and they're relatively small together, and you have a completely passive, completely serviceless way to generate pure water oh. in the middle of anywhere. That's uh, great. That and, is really good. And there are Especially other companies like that at CES that did generation of water, but most of them were like desal, where they required mm. heavy, heavy equipment. This is the only solution I saw where it's literally drop it in the middle of nowhere, you never clean anything, and it will generate pure water. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's condensation on what they call a hydrophilic coating. So rather than condensing on like a coil where you get heavy metals into the water, it's just a coating that the water uh, particles are attracted to. They condense and then they just collect. Wow. So yeah, CES was fun. You should come next year. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see if that happens. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. When is the last time we went to CES? Uh, I, we I have, was last there in the year 2000. Oh, okay. Do you think, well, now it was 2012. Was that the Walkman? Yeah, they were the same. <laughs> I, you know, no. and, and did you get sick? I did not. Oh, congratulations. Not this time. Not this time. Yeah. We'll see if we can change that uh, while I you're think, here. I think, oh, man. Well, I'm just saying. Uh, I, I saw bound? a lot of people with you're masks, due. though, so maybe it's just <laughs> That's what they were needed. keeping me safe. <laughs> Father Robert Ballas there. Um, always, always great to uh, oh, chat with so you. Nice and thanks for back. dropping into the middle oh. seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, man. And we miss you. I miss and you. And enjoy Rome. And yes. we'll talk to you uh, the next time you swing by. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, coming up in these trying times, look to emoji to save the day. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience that they want. You can power up your site uh, or your app with Cashfly's CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. No matter what industry your business is in, if your website is directly tied to company revenue, uh, you can give your customers the fast downloads that they need with Cashfly. Cashfly's CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. It's backed by a 100% SLA. Uh, Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are or what device they happen to be on. You can join thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, <laughs> and Ars Technica, just to name a few. Uh, obviously, we've been hosting all of our podcasts, our audio, our video on Cashfly for nearly a decade. Leo has been a huge proponent of Cashfly services because we, we've thrived because of Cashfly. Every month, our viewers and listeners download petabytes of data fast and flawlessly. Twit literally would not exist without Cashfly, especially at this point. So say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week or even worse, daily trying to track your CDN usage. You don't need that. No billing spikes. You get a custom plan tailored to your CDN needs uh, based on yearly usage trends. On average, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. So just imagine what you could do with that 20%, uh, and especially your own time. And just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. See if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN. You can learn more at twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. 
and we thank Cashfly for their ongoing support. Chief Emoji Officer at Emojipedia and host of the Emoji Wrap podcast is visiting the Bay Area for a conference at Google, and he agreed, agreed to come into the studio to talk to us about all the latest emoji news. Welcome to the studio, Jeremy Birch. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, officer. Do I salute you? Do I yes. salute you with an emoji? That if is, so, uh, which is the emoji that mm. I use? Is there a saluting emoji? There isn't. I, I, I feel like be. one has been proposed. Yeah. Sort of, you know, it's pretty flexible, military, but also just... Well, chief emoji officer. Yeah. Yeah. When they come oh, around, you need right. that salute emoji. Exactly. Top of the list. Uh, yeah, so no, I am in town for, it's the Unicode Technical Committee meeting, which is held every quarter. This one's at Google in Mountain View. And since I'm in town, it's nice to pop up. Yeah. yeah. At, uh, rainy Petaluma today. <laughs> <laughs> so the la was the last one at Apple? Uh, yeah, last one was, uh, no, Microsoft and then Apple oh, before that. It. it rotates around. And then it'll be back at Apple. Or do you uh, guys get to host it? Emojipedia. Oh, that would be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> we, don't, we don't really have an office. So uh. <laughs> it could be a bit tricky, but yeah, we could we could put it in an offer. No, I like getting the free canteen at all the places. You yes. go to the big, get the nice food. Spend the off. time at, at the Google campus. That's, yeah, yeah. That's I'm the way happy. to do it. I'm yeah. happy for all the mm -hmm. people to host. So yeah. what can you tell? Can you tell us any of the emoji secrets that were, were discussed? <laughs> can, I break, can I break the secrets? So how yeah. it works is everything that's discussed during the week. Uh, it's all minuted, but what happens is I know what's happened, but the minutes don't come out for like a week or a month or whatever to make sure that it's kind of like when you have stock and things, like everyone gets to know at the same time. But I can tell you things that were submitted to be talked about, things like recommendations for 2020. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what they're already talking about now, things like a disguised face, uh, there's a fly, uh, a ladder. These are things that are sort of recommended to be maybe added. There's a disguised face, like wearing a mask or covered or what? Like It sort of looks like Groucho Marx, like uh, glasses uh, and a mustache. Uh, oh, okay. Because yeah. there's right, already a mask. Like there's already a, a emoji with a health mask. Yeah, right? there's, there's right. There's the medical mask. mask. There's also Japanese sort of goblin masks mm -hmm. and things. There's that. And at the same meeting, so this meeting, there's decisions about this year's list, which will come out in two months. And then they're already talking about next year's list. So it's all, it's all, it's all happening in Emoji mm -hmm. Land. Emoji never stops. No. Never stops. Never and stop. Never quit. <laughs> uh, so you're an expert in um, in design, well, like in you know how uh, images uh, portray certain things. So the biggest news this week for me is Slack's redesign. Uh, oh boy! Their logo was redesigned. I actually had to Slack Jason to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. I was like, my Slack <laughs> is all different, and I'm at home. Please tell me it's I'm thing. not dying. Yeah. Um, so tell us your thoughts on the Slack logo redesign. I mean, I also missed the When it first came out, I got the update on my Mac and I looked in my dock and was looking for Slack and I couldn't find it because the old icon, like any icon, I mean, I'm always sympathetic to the view. People always complain. Any new icon or logo yeah. comes out, the internet hates it. They all complain. But you get used to it. You do right. get used to it. I have to say, though, that... So it's fine. It's sort of generic, let's say. And their logic, the reason that Slack gave for using this logo, and there's always a big story. We have a big medium post or whatever to explain mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the deep thoughts that went behind it. And they make some good points that like their play to the old logo didn't work on many backgrounds and the different contexts. It sort of had a hash sort of checker mark before, sometimes the letter S. I get it. But to me, this logo being so generic, I, th I think it's not for us. It's for like the business people of mm. the world. It's, it's okay. uh, yeah, so it's about, it's for the business people. Do they, do they care about it? Does it look better on reports? Does it look better on documentation? That sort of thing. I don't think, it, I think users like the old one. I don't know. I um, like the old one. I like Although the, I totally understand where they were coming from. Like it, the, it's kind, it was kind of a complex logo. And I think they said they, they made it before, you know, they be, actually became a company. It was, it was one of the very first things they did. And it has like 16 different colors within it placing it on like a white background versus a black background versus whatever other colors uh, would would kind of play around in sometimes a negative way with the way the logo actually uh, looked uh, placed on those backgrounds. So I get it. I'd be I interested to see. I don't know. There's a lot of talk about Slack hasn't had an IPO. They've had a lot of funding. Yeah. I feel like this is... It's preparation. It's prep work. Stone. It's not for us. It's to look good on reports. It's sure. to look fancy. There are $1.2 billion in funding, in seed funding. Mm -hmm. Like they've had a lot of money come into them. Sometime they're going to want to go on the market and you want to have your best impression and the investors don't care about what we care about. They want you to look professional and all your docs and everything. They don't probably even use Slack. They, they want to spend their money on something sensible 
and this makes Slack look like a grown-up big boy company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably who this is targeted at. And we'll all forget about it in a month. So <laughs> they're like, the yeah, users, we're using it for the product. We're going to moan about it. We're going to have some fun for a month. Yep. But really... That's my that's my impression is this is for the for the investors or for other people. Yeah, we should sense. mention that Slack is a sponsor on the Twit Network. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, kind of looking through some of your previous posts, and you had a post on Emojipedia uh, at the end of last year where you were kind of looking back at 2018 and uh, emoji trends, as it were, something that I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about, <laughs> but this is your life. So yeah, that's me. Of course you have opinions on this. And you were talking in this article about convergence in the emoji space, about how, uh, how maybe now is the time where finally all of these different disparate kind of interpretations of, emo of the emoji set are starting to come together to where Yes, the emojis are different between Samsung and Apple and all these different platforms, but they're representing kind of like the same thing. It's like it's always a, a woman in a red dress dancing. Yeah, it just looks you know similar w without the kind of the shades of gray in between. Um, I don't know. What what do you think of, about that? Do you think it's stripping away some of the uniqueness of emoji, or do you think this is necessary? I, I think the companies had to swallow some of their ego to some degree. That each company, when they brought out an emoji, they believed it's the best version of that. Sure, a, oh, a shy absolutely. face or a happy face or a sad face. But unfortunately, over time, the users are going to give them feedback, and they're going to say, "I like this face, but it doesn't look like what my friend receives." So. Mm -hmm. Uh, they've still got their own visual style. Samsung's still a bit sort of cuter, but as you say, they have the same intention a bit more now. It's very hard to find strong outliers. As of 2018, 18, nearly every vendor, they all have the water pistol instead of the gun now. They've all got a dancer in a red dress. Right. All the faces, the grimace looks like a grimace. There were a few years where sometimes it looked uh, happy, sometimes it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, people do say like, yeah, I have heard feedback to say, oh, you know, especially... People like to talk about Google's blobs, go yeah. on about the blobs. You could bring back the blobs and keep the theme. So there is room to play around, but you just right. have to make sure that, yeah, you're conveying the same uh, emotion. And to some degree, I think that's taken some of the companies a while to get around to it and say, you know what? We can't lead this. We're just going to kind of do what everyone else is doing. I, I'm realizing as you're talking that I, I completely understand why emoji is device specific and how, you know, my device is going to have a set of emoji downloaded to it. So there's not a whole lot of data. It's just here's a code that it's represented on the device by the graphics, show the graphic. But in an alternate universe, maybe it makes more sense for the emoji that the person receives uh, to be the emoji that the person on the other end actually sent. In other words, not emoji stored on my device that interprets what they send, but if that person actually sent a grimace instead of a smile, yep. that ends up being the thing that you receive on the other end. But that's, that's just not realistic. Right? right, that would totally make sense in a different yeah. universe. And that's how, I mean, that's to some degree how different apps, like we mentioned Slack before, they have custom emoji that, that sends the same thing to everybody. Yeah, but that, that's not what emoji is, right? Emoji yeah. works like text. And the reason it's popular is that it's on every phone and it works in every app. And the sort of the sending inline images isn't a standard that, that exists. Yeah, so that yeah, I think totally. I think people would be on board. They'd love that. It just, it wouldn't be emoji. It would be some other feature and it wouldn't work in every app. Yeah, it'd be stickers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of the cl class, cl cross-platform stuff, uh, the new Galaxy phone, the new Samsung Galaxy Whatever, 10, maybe. S9, S10, 11, I think. The new one will be 10. 10. Yeah. Um, so uh, there were some leaks of that, and you got to uh, look and see that maybe there were some Apple-like emoji there? Yes. So there's some sort of leaks coming out. Samsung, they're supposedly launching the Galaxy S10 next month uh, in the middle of February. Uh, something Samsung have always been the biggest outlier when it comes to emoji and a big issue has been they've always had this layer of software on top of Android there's always sort of they've gone through different names over the years and you know but stock Android or the most googly Android and then Samsung put their layer on top they call it Samsung experience mm -hmm. they're rebooting it they're calling it Samsung one UI next year uh, this year, now, this year, and uh, the, that's coming out on the S10. That'll be on the next phones. It's already kicking around in beta right now. Some of the emojis are more Apple-like again on this one. Uh, they haven't officially made any announcements in their communications. To me, they still keep calling it Samsung Experience 10.0. Um, Samsung, uh, as a, they, they never feel like a cohesive company to me. They often feel like individual, you, f you feel the different parts of the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you can't ask Samsung support, hey, when's my phone getting an update to the latest Samsung experience? And they'll go, oh, 
maybe check with your vendor, your carrier, or yeah, which region kind of you're like in. Like Google, in that sense. Yeah. Google also has that they do. problem. But it's, then it's an extra layer, right? Yes. And Samsung update their emojis in particular at a different time that they, for instance, Google might wait till Android 9 Pi for the emoji. Samsung might put it on Google 8, Android 8, but in their own layer. So mm -hmm. we'll see. The, the promise is it will be more stripped back. It will be less fussing where they don't need to be. So I'm interested to see. I would like, hopefully, though, the less they do, the more coherent they could be when you say, Samsung, when am I getting this update? They might at least be able to give a ballpark, is my mm -hmm. hope, rather yeah. than just... Our users come to me and Emojipedia all the time. They say, when are we getting this Samsung thing? And they, I, have, I have no idea. It's on my phone. I don't know why you don't have it. <laughs> Makes no sense. It's kind of broken a little bit. Yeah. Um, there was a Wired story that I, I read uh, from earlier this month. It talked about, so, okay, I have, I have kids. I have five and an almost nine-year-old daughter. And when they get a hold of my wife's phone... And they, you know, they realize, especially my nine-year-old, but my five-year-old has done it too. And they realize that there is a messaging app that they can communicate with me through. It's usually just this like nonstop, random, seemingly random string of emoji. And I'm, I'm quite convinced that, you know, my five-year-old especially probably just opened it up and goes, oh, cool graphics and just yeah. starts tapping all of them. But I read this article in Wired that was kind of like diving into how children, especially young children, are thinking uh, via you know this communication of using emoji in in messaging apps are actually thinking about digital communication, developing skills around this from a very young age now. Even if it seems random, they're still you know as they get older, there's there's thought around it. Like these oh, the things that I put on the screen, it may seem random, but they all chomp on things or whatever the case may be. Right. What, what do you think about that? How, how do you think emoji is kind of helping young children kind of develop these digital communication I did skills? see this article and it's from Gretchen McCulloch, who's a linguist who's very into emoji and words, obviously, <laughs> but, <laughs> of course. But, she, but she's quite good. She's done a lot of research over the years. She's very into emoji is a good proxy for when we think about language, we don't understand all the terms in language yeah. and how people pick it up and how people use it, but we kind of, well, we get it. If you get a message from a five-year-old with a bunch of emojis, you can think, do they know what's going on here? And what she found as well is it's not that the younger you are, to some degree, they might just be picking colorful things. But what happens is that it's not just that they're sending you nonsense sometimes, which is often the case, but adults will write back to them and they might write words. And that there is, it's too early to say right now, but it's quite possible that they, these kids, by being exposed to words, like kids hear words in the room, if you get a bunch of emojis and you write back, oh, that's great, and put some emojis, they'll start to put that together, that, oh, the, the word great and a friendly emoji. Mm, so that's quite okay. possible, I think. So that it's in the early stage. That's sort of a hypothesis, I yeah. think, from Gretchen at the moment, is that maybe it would be interesting to see if there's adults... Not writing full sentences back, but maybe there's a little bit of English or a little bit of words mixed in with the emoji. Maybe these kids actually pick it up quicker then because they've been exposed to the words. You never type a text message without emoji to a three-year-old. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't think, oh, hey, three-year-old, how's it going? Mm -hmm. But if you put a bunch of emojis and some words, maybe maybe that helps. That's mm -hmm. kind of the beauty of emoji too, right? Like it, it's a level of communication that doesn't require knowledge around words. Because when I think about like my five-year-old sending me random stuff, often it's full of hearts. Yep. It's full of sparkly things. You know what I mean? And and to a large degree, that's that's her in a sense identifying with those symbols and saying, "Hey, you know, I am a, I am a child full of love. Here, yeah. have some hearts." You know, right? It's and that's a communication random. in and of itself, yeah, right. even if it seems random. Yeah, that's right. It's still a state of mind. Should, yes. should still understand what hearts are and faces in particular. If you got a bunch of sad faces or angry faces. It doesn't necessarily mean she's sad or angry, but she wants to convey that idea to you. She yeah, can yeah. understand what those are. Sure. So I think that that is it. We've never had this before, right? Yeah, We've right. never had, I guess kids have had stickers they could post, but there's a there's a threshold. A three-year-old by themselves can't post a letter, but mm. they get, you, you know, they get tablets and phones. If it's unlocked in front of them, they can hit the buttons and tap send. Mm -hmm. And that's... I don't think we've seen it before. The words are boring, emojis are fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, and so what about when kids get older? I know you spent some time at Eton, the boarding school in the UK. Um, what was it like to, What? how do teenagers think about emoji differently than maybe young people or adults? Teenagers get weird about it. They're all like, they want to know what everyone else is doing. Like, they can't, like anything, they want to be cool. 
so, so in some areas it's like, oh, too many emojis, that's not cool. Like, you know, because for no particular reason, it's mm-hmm. just someone said that and everyone. So were you not cool when you went there? Uh, no, they liked me because, you know, they're like, you run a company, I guess. So that's that, <laughs> that, that that's kind of the okay. more fun part. Um, so I don't think they weren't um, big, big emoji users. They kind of just took it for granted. It's kind of bo- yeah. not quite boring, but kind of like, oh yeah, cool. It's another thing. It's yeah. one thing they've always had and used. If I went and talked about punctuation, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> Isn't it amazing we have an exclamation mark now? <laughs> like, yeah. what kind of an emoji is this exclamation mark? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, they were interested, obviously, in the behind that. the scenes and whatever. But usage-wise, teens, it's just part of their language. Yes, yeah. they'll use it. They're not thinking that much about it because they're kind of fluent in it. They're just going to, yeah, they're going to use one if they need to. But at least some of the research is showing that, yeah, like, it's kids that mash the emo- you get young kids that sort of mash a lot of emojis. Teens are kind of selective, and then you get ironic about it as you become a bit older again, and then you sort of get the more just sensible emojis. You get you sort of get on to being an older adult and you just start using a thumbs up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you get real boring. We're so boring. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's definitely, and that's all we see as well, that you tend to see older people are being more literate, uh, more literal, where yeah, they're just sending right. you what they think, except my grandma, who's a big fan watching the show. She <laughs> loves Tech News Weekly, um, except her, like... She, She'll do a lot of decorative things, but mostly yeah. we see the stats where older people tend to use just a static set. They, they would just want to use a smiley or a thumbs up because they're not seeing the double meanings or mm-hmm. sort of an ironic use of it. They're just kind of going, yeah. My mom yes. always uses the kissing emoji. Just that's her thing. The, the one with the heart? Yeah. 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 <gasps> is that not called the kissing emoji? Oh, no, it is. There's three though because there's the oh. kissing face without the heart leaving it. Oh. It's just the lips. Oh. And that gosh. one's the blowing a kiss. Emoji. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. that's the one she uses. I don't know. And without, she, oh, yeah. I think it she only sense. uses it with me. I don't think she uses it with like everyday people. <laughs> Doesn't send that to Jason. <laughs> or, uh, no. I don't know, does she? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No. No. Um, the kissing one without the heart is weird because it kind of looks like whistling or oh, it's yeah, kind of yeah, just got yeah. pursed lips. So don't use that one. That's weird. Okay. The, the blowing the heart. That's very good. That's very good shorthand for yeah. uh, thinking of you. Yeah. Okay. For the right people. Are there any other emoji we shouldn't use? <laughs> as far as shouldn't use, I mean, <laughs> I feel it like... you should, your interpretation. Yeah, yeah, you should be free to do what you want to do. Um, yeah, obviously the ones like that. The, the hugging one is complicated. Being jazz hands or a hug, that's a bit complicated. Yeah, right. Um, I've never, anytime I've ever seen that, yeah. it's never said to me hugging. It right. Just, it says, I don't know what it says. I guess jazz hands would be it, but. I'm conscious of it knowing, weird. yeah. Would I hug this person, even though it's meant to be excited? The biggest issue I find is two or three years ago, Unicode encoded two different fist bumps, a left and a right, but they kind of look like punching. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. So, like, I don't that want, and then yeah. thought, oh, I don't want that person to think I'm like punching them. Right, you, you yeah. type it, you think, oh, this is good, fist bump, and then you kind of think, oh, I don't oh. have to explain it to say, by the way, that's not a punch. That's a fist. Oh, I would never funny. punch I've you. I've never thought that. Yeah. yeah. You can put them together, right? Yeah, but put then, them together yeah. and then that makes more sense. And that's but. why Unicode did them at the time. So you could have different skin tones as well. So I could send you one and someone could send one back and they match, but you don't want to send two. You don't fist bump someone with two hands. Yeah, that's <laughs> you, true. You do, you, yeah. know, you do one. And you don't want to assume that they'd fist bump you back. Exactly. They might leave you hanging. Yeah. Yeah. And we need an emoji to represent that. So I've definitely before now sent the punch, the, the fist bump and said, not a punch. And then I'm like, what's the point of this? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> what, what I have uh, never thought that when I've sent the fist bump emoji and I send it a lot. I wonder if that's like a, because I, I would, ne- I don't think anyone would ever think I would punch them, you know. So. Uh, uh, no, never mind. I'm not <laughs> Except you. It. I'm not going to say. You. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. So I, I, you're right. Hopefully, you're a nice enough person that people see your intentions. But right. It's just it depends on the 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 means of communication. Yeah. Yeah. I know uh, the threshold for me or you, we're not we're not moving stock markets when this happens. Mm-hmm. But I chat to CEOs, uh, people that do get all this vetted for them before they tweet. Obviously, Elon Musk and the like sometimes just goes and tweets anyway, right. but yeah, like right. other CEOs a bit more have PR teams and they will check the emoji first yeah. just to be sure. Tim Cook's not going to um, be tweeting out the eggplant emoji. Correct. Probably. And if he tries to, I'm sure someone on his PR team will go, hey, Tim, by the way, <laughs> right. let me just, can I just, uh, how about, how about can I have your uh, logging yeah. credentials? Yeah. Just a moment. How about a strawberry? That's good too. <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to hear more about emoji, Jeremy and I sat down uh, for a, a, an hour to talk all about his career, how he started his company, and um, all your emoji questions answered. And that'll be on Triangulation tomorrow. Jeremy Burge, founder and emoji officer, chief emoji officer at Emojipedia. 
Um, and he can be found on Twitter, uh, emojipedia.org, everywhere, even uh, Tumblr. Tumblr, you yeah. You're still active yeah. on Tumblr. Love Tumblr. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's safe for work now. Tumblr yeah. is safe for work now yeah, as well. Exactly, so, yeah, exactly. Yes. You know, everyone jump on board. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thank everybody, you. Jeremy. Fair use and scooter hacking coming up. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. The right hire can make a huge impact on your business. That's why it's so important to find the right person. But where do you find that individual? You can post a job on a job board and hope the right person will find your job. But think about it. How often do you hang out on job boards? Me, not so much. Don't leave finding someone great to chance when you can post your job to a place where people go every day to make connections, grow in their career, and discover job opportunities. You know where that is? LinkedIn. Most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited the top job boards, but nine out of 10 members are open to new opportunities. And with 70% of the U.S. workforce on LinkedIn, posting on LinkedIn is the best way to get your job opportunity in front of the most people and not just the most people but the right people people who are qualified for your role and ready for something new it's the best way to find the person who will help you grow your business and why a new hire is made every 10 seconds using linkedin every 10 seconds that's why hurry to linkedin.com slash tech news get 50 dollars off your first job post that's linkedin.com slash tech news to get 50 dollars off your first job post terms and conditions apply linkedin.com slash tech news now, over the weekend, there was a little kerfuffle of sorts on Twitter when fair use expert Cory Doctorow announced that he'd received a takedown notice from electronic scooter company Bird because of a link that he put in an article on Boing Boing, his website, uh, about how to repurpose an old scooter. Now, that's right. It was a takedown notice for a link. Bird has since apologized to Dr. O for its overzealous lawyers, but we still thought it was worth talking to the author of the original article, which was posted late last year. Welcome, Brian Benchoff from Hackaday. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. So before we get to the contents of the article itself, uh, were you surprised by all the brouhaha over the weekend? Uh, at from Cory Doctorow. Um, well, you don't send a takedown notice to Cory Doctorow. No. <laughs> exactly. No. Yeah. yeah that, I think that's like internet rule number one or maybe two, but it's right up yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of knew that he was going to apologize. That was, that was an ill-conceived idea, yes. <laughs> Maybe they just didn't know who he was. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so tell us where you, how you got the idea uh, to repurpose these scooters. Um, well, so over on the scooter, one of the scooter talk forums, um, some genius, absolute genius, realized that his town impounded scooters which means there were hundreds of scooters sitting in just a lockup in town. Well, these scooters cost $400 and they're probably getting like $20 a day times a hundred. So those scooters are literally unprofitable for bird to claim. Hmm. They can just buy more and get, yeah. Um, so those scooters are going to auction which means somebody can just buy a hundred bird scooters for however much money. And then you can get a $30 motherboard the, that replaces the bird motherboard in the scooter. And you get hundreds of free scooters for uh, maybe a thousand bucks. So, yeah, you see there, the, that's the picture of the bird scooter in lockup. <laughs> so they're, yeah. they're impounded, the uh, they're impounded because the town or, or the municipality has decided that they uh, are not, they don't want them on their streets or they were just, why, why were they impounded? Well, it's a better solution than throwing them into the lake, which is what San Francisco was doing. Well, the people of San Francisco were doing, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, um, they didn't want them on their street, and they just impounded them. So, uh, I mean, move fast and break things like laws. So. <laughs> right. So we should back up a little bit. So, so these Bird and other scooter companies just put them out there without first getting um, the right to have them out there. Oh yeah, it was right. um, back in what was it, April, March or April last year mm -hmm. that they just arrived. They they just it was magic. Were, it was, it, it, yeah, the scooter tree, just super <laughs> harvest. Um, and they just flew out there. And I think uh, I, 
it was bird or lime weren't ready to ship their units, but because one company did and the other company didn't, they just had to go mm-hmm. because first mover, whoever gets there first wins. Um, the early bird gets the worm. Ooh, oh, yeah. yes. Hey, yeah, that was good. That was, yes. That, was <laughs> yes. I mean, that might have actually been part of their business plan. <laughs> I, I could see that on, on the printout. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about kind of how how we got here to Cory Doctorow posting and then them, you know, getting getting all legal. Like you posted the article last year that kind of illustrates how you do this, uh, yet- oh. This was yeah. not this was not approached by Bird. It was the attention that was shown on it by Cory Doctorow's post. It, yeah. Talk about uh, well, that a well, um, yeah, I don't believe the whatever forum got a takedown notice from that. Um, I didn't get a takedown notice from that, but it, I, I don't know if it's a popularity thing. Like you put this on Boing Boing, a lot of people are going to see it. That's but, true. Uh, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, all the information is out there. If you want to see a bird brain, wait, which way? There we go. Now, yeah, bird that, brain a, is that taken from a bird scooter, or is this oh, the yeah, Chinese? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We, no. yeah, so, yeah. So we have the bird. Oh man, there's a lag. Uh, so this is just a bird brain, and all it is is just a board with a particle dev board and um, a GPS unit. And the stock unit, which you can buy from uh, AliExpress or China, is just thirty dollars. And this is a drop-in replacement. And this this replaces this. So um, there are. It is if you can get cheap scooters from Lockout legally, you have a thirty-dollar scooter, or forty dollars, or whatever. I'm very interested in seeing where the bird hacking goes because we also have, um, you know, the Tesla Powerwall. Mm-hmm. It's made of units like this, <laughs> which this is 30 um, 18650 cells. So you get a few legal, I'm, I'm going to emphasize legal bird scooters, and you can build a Tesla Powerwall for probably like 20% of the price of what the DIYers are going so so this entire thing is I'm calling bird boxing because <laughs> memes <laughs> so uh, yeah um. well so I so there have you heard from bird I mean there's nothing illegal about buying a scooter from a city and then doing whatever you want with it or is it is it in terms of like the same way you fixing your John Deere, you know, the right to repair movement stuff is illegal. Like, is it illegal to buy a scooter? I I can't imagine any law that you would have that you buy a impounded scooter from city lockup and you do anything with it. I I can't understand how that could be illegal because uh, birds, it was a, was it the DMCA for Mm -hmm. Roy Doctorow Mm -hmm. that it's not hardware. It, like this, this board, it's not software, this mm. board, there's no encryption on this board. And it, like removing this is not defeating encryption. I mean, so. <laughs> <laughs> and it is an interesting question because it's a question of, of oh, the, the question in the past over around the right to repair movement is about ownership. Like right. I own this, so therefore I should get to um, fix it, but, and you do own it, but like Bird never imagined that people would own their scooters. That wasn't what, that wasn't their hope when they came up with this idea for scooters on, on demand scooters. Well, for the, for the Bird scooter, there's no real secret sauce. These are um, Xiaomi or something, just standard off the shelf Chinese electric scooters that you can buy right now for $400. Okay, and then they drop in. They have a nice little injection molded thing with the QR code on top, and they drop their bird brain in. Um, that's that's how Bird manufactures their scooters. Uh, if you just take that off, there's nothing Bird tied to the scooter. The scooter can be independent of the Bird brain with this thirty dollar motherboard replacement. So. Um, 
because that's the I, way it was prior that, to birds snapping I, it up and putting their own stuff on there to I, begin I, with. I mean, I mean, literally, you could take this, buy a forty, buy a four hundred dollar scooter, and make your own bird scooter <laughs> if you wanted to for some reason. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> You too can uh, own your scooter by the limitations of the company bird. Um, yeah, so you mentioned in your write-up just about how how kind of the scooter hacking world you say is one of the most interesting uh, adventures, let's say, in uh, in modern day hacking. Um, I mean, you you talked a little bit about this kind of the power wall aspect of this if if someone was to go to auction and snap up a bunch of these what, like what else could they do what if i'm not, i'm not the the hacker type to know so, what so, i could do um, with this but what are some of the cool things you could do well okay i, I want to preface this by saying that picking up sco electric scooters from the sidewalk and then turning them into anything is the most cyberpunk thing <laughs> this is the cyberpunk future we all deserve because it's <laughs> awesome um Apart from that, um, I can think of possibly three things. You can take the battery module and build a power wall, because I mean, this is this is this thing weighs like yeah, three or four pounds. This is yeah, how many? This is what two hundred and eighty watt hours. So you get a you get a couple dozen of those, and you can run your run TV for a day. Um, the power wall idea. There's also a motor inside. I, I haven't done the math, but if you wanted to build a drone out of it, I don't know if it would work. It's kind of a very large, low RPM motor. You might be able to build a fixed wing drone, but you might not be able to build a quadcopter. Mm. And then, of course, you just you can just have a scooter or a non-electric scooter. Oh, a a hey, non-electric scooter? Why not? Why not? Why not? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think this is it's sort of ridiculous. I think Bird is back down. At the, I mean, they've fully backed down because the idea is I mean, we're creating so much tech waste and mm. we should be encouraging people who are going to make something out of it to do, sure. to repurpose it, to use something else. So, um, and so you, that is, is that mostly what you do on Hackaday? Um, yeah, yeah. Repurposing it's, stuff? It's repurposing things um ironically some of our best hacks come from people finding stuff on the sidewalk like an old projection tv and let's just turn that into a 3d printer which i mean talk, let's talk about the legality of finding stuff on the sidewalk and repurposing it for our own needs um like a scooter but um uh, yeah it's it's repurposing it's bizarre cyberpunk engineering so yeah love it well brian thank you for giving yep. us the cyberpunk future that we all deserve <laughs> helping yes. give us that <laughs> brian benchoff yes. is a contributor to hackaday he is also an insecurity researcher you can find him on twitter and github at b benchoff thanks so much for coming on thank you brian thank you we appreciate it take we'll talk care to you soon. yep all right, finally, uh, you remember last week, we are one week into the 2019 Twit Switch, where Megan and I agreed to trade our tablets and keyboard accessories for three total weeks to see how my preference, the Pixel Slate running Chrome OS, compares to Megan's preference, the Apple iPad Pro, right? This is the Pro. Uh, so let's start with you, Megan. You've, you've had kind of a week to kind of settle into the Pixel Slate running Chrome OS. What are your thoughts so far? Uh, battery life is good. I probably haven't pushed it as you've caught me many times using my MacBook. Um, it's, it's hard. Change is hard. <laughs> it changes hard. Uh, I will say having a full web browser, um, is amazing. Like on a tablet, on something that fits neatly in my purse and folds up. Um, yeah. that is great. I love it. Like for, you know, for example, when I use the iPad doing a show like this, I, it's much harder to use Google Sheets, which is where we keep our script stuff in. I can log into our chat room at the same time. Um, uh, one thing and multi-user support also great because yeah, we so had an emergency like my OS. kids have iPads just old-fashioned iPads and we don't have keyboards for them for their school and you know when they're in eighth grade they're doing some harder work and so um, one of them has been you know logging in multi-user so easy to just get to Google Classroom um, uh, once I got the idea, so I, I set out looking at this like I look at the iPad. The first thing I do is like, I'm going to download a bunch of apps. I'm going to download the Twitter app. I'm going to download the Google Sheets app, you know, all, all the apps I use. That was n 
a pretty bad experience. There, <laughs> there were like, sometimes they looked like the shape of a phone. They were buggy. They, they um, crashed. Yeah. Um, and so I came into you and I was like, what, what's the deal with all these apps? And you said, you don't use apps. Uh, like you, you mostly, you use Twitter in the browser. You use um, Gmail in the browser. Yeah. You don't, you just most, mostly you use this thousand dollar device as a web browser. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's a web browser that can also run Android apps, but I would say on the hierarchy of like the order of how to, how to use a Chrome OS tablet, I would say at the very top is using it as a browser and using things that are designed for the web through the desktop experience in the browser itself. So Twitter in the browser, Gmail, especially in the browser. Down from that would be like the Chrome apps, which a lot of times are just kind of like I mean, it's it's the same, same, but a little different. Mm -hmm. They might add extra features into their extension or whatever. Down at the bottom is Android apps. That's like, I can't get any other way to do this particular thing. So here's an app that might be my workaround. So let me ask you something. Um, have I been getting apps in the wrong place? Because I'm going to the Google Play Store. That's where you get Chrome apps or do you get Chrome apps from no. some other store? No, you get Chrome apps from a different store. It really is silly as we talk about this because it just it kind of it kind of <laughs> so it epitomizes just how how kind of broken Google can be. So as I guess as I haven't even downloaded stuff. any Chrome apps. Um, yeah, if you haven't gone to the Chrome oh. web uh, web app store, then you it's probably the Google haven't. Play Store that implies everything. <laughs> That's yeah, not really. It should. Or maybe it should. Uh, I don't know. But yes, if you're going to the Play Store, you're downloading the Android uh, version of apps. Okay. All right. Well, next week I'll have uh, some more to say. Um, I do like the keyboard. I love having a trackpad. Um, that's really nice. Um, I, I love, like, I like to connect it to uh, a bigger display, which you can do with the yeah. iPad Pro as well, but you can't charge the iPad Pro at the same time. But there's two little um, USB-C ports here so I can yeah. charge and connect. Uh, which is great. So um, I think what I'm saying is that I both love it and am confounded by it. Confounded because it's an well, the, expensive web browser. Yeah. And the app thing. I mean, I guess I, 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 uh, I, I feel silly now that I didn't know there was a Chrome app store. Well, I mean, Google doesn't do a really great job of, of like pointing that out, right? Like there's no real onboarding process when you first fire up a Chrome OS tablet for the first time or a Chrome OS device where it says, and you can go here to get your Chrome mm -hmm. web apps, or, or at least if there is, I disregarded it because mm -hmm. I don't remember ever seeing it. So you wouldn't really know unless you knew, mm -hmm. you know? It's true. <laughs> All right, thoughts? All right, so the iPad Pro... Um, again, I'll start with battery life. Like I'm really impressed with the battery life on this thing. And I, I, and I think Apple's just good with battery life in general. Part of that, is, I, I believe is just because they, they control what's going on in the background enough to really dedicate that battery to the thing you're doing right now. And, uh, so like, I think this, this battery was charged up to like 27% when we started the show. And here we are an hour later and it's at 23%. That, and I mean, the display has been on the entire time I've been using it. So, I mean, I, I feel like it burns through battery very slowly. And that's a really big um, benefit of this. Uh, apps as they are in iOS, well-designed. And, you know, uh, I think Apple does a much better job of taking its phone apps and making it or giving giving apps more of a reason to exist in a tablet form factor i don't think android's ever done that very well and chrome os with android uh you know app capability as you've seen really doesn't do that very well just because it's on a tablet and it's it's blown up doesn't mean the experience is good the twitter app is awful uh, and I saw you running it on there. It is just uh, that's why you use the web app or the website yeah. instead of an app itself. So I think iOS does a really great job of that with the with the iPad productivity, though. Like, I feel like this this is all about like testing the productive productivity kind of capabilities of, of, of switching platforms. I feel like it's apples to oranges. You know what I mean? Like um, Chrome OS is meant to be a productivity environment. Mm -hmm. iPad like you can, and I've got the keyboard attachment, so it kind of makes it feel like you're being more productive or whatever, but I just keep running into roadblocks that mm -hmm. just slow me down and make me feel like, man, you know, I spent four hours on Tuesday using just the iPad to create the doc for All About Android in Google Docs. So granted, I'm using still Google's product, but I'm using Google's app product of Google Sheets. And 
I mean, after four hours, like I really wanted to do the entire thing and I just couldn't. There were just certain things that it was slowing me down too, too much. I was going to run out of time and I just, I just couldn't make it do the things that I needed it to do. And so I ultimately, I had to move to a different machine and I feel like, I feel like I failed in doing that because I didn't dedicate 100%, but it just wasn't working, mm -hmm. you know, and there's only so much you can do. So I think that's a, a testament to kind of the productivity aspects of this. If I was to go all in on Apple's suite, I'm sure that would be a different story, right? Like I mean, if, Google Sheets would still be a really bad experience on the iPad. I mean, not yeah. a really bad, but not as bad as it used to be. I think it's kind of like- It's improved. It's improved. Yeah. So they're like, oh, I can do this now, but it's still, it's not as good as is on the Pixel or a, you know, yeah, a laptop. I'm, I mean, I'm using the Sheets app right now to run the show and it's fine. Um, it, it works fine. And I like, um, I, I like using it from like an operational standpoint during a show. Mm -hmm. I could totally do this. But creating. Creating was really painful. Yeah. Super painful. So uh, the lack of a touchpad also, uh -huh. like I'm super used to that, but that's not really part of the iOS paradigm to have mm -hmm. a cursor zipping mm -hmm. around. So I get why it's not there, but I miss it, you mm -hmm. know, in this kind of productivity aspect. So that's kind of where I am right now. The pen up at the top, it just keeps staring at me. I keep not using it. I don't know why I need to use it. And I'm sure one of these days I'm going to try and test it out, but I just have no reason for a pen. Uh, you never like That's to me, take though. notes That's not... by hand? I'll just type it in. There's a keyboard there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's fun sometimes to take notes. That's true. If I remove it, does it automatically take me to where I need to go? No. No. Oh, no. okay. Well, then uh, I'll put it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, well, <laughs> and Leo connect. said he had a pencil for this, um, but he didn't give it to me. And I, I actually don't know what I would use it for either, like, yeah. unless I wanted to take handwritten notes. or I right. mean, but what we suggested to you in our production meeting was maybe you'd like to relax with a coloring book app or something. You're telling me I need to relax. I need to chill out. I see. I see where we're going. I don't know why you would say that, Megan. Yeah, maybe I do. <laughs> and maybe, maybe that will open up some doors for me. Uh, but this is just one week. One of three mm -hmm. weeks. So next week and then the week after. And then I guess we'll uh, kind of share our well-formed Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts around it, but mm -hmm. after I, I use the Chrome app store, <laughs> yes, that's your next challenge. <laughs> yeah. My next challenge is to do some coloring book apps. Yes. <laughs> so we've got very different uh, goals here. Tech news weekly records live every Thursday, starting at 11 AM Pacific at twit.tv slash live. You can always be part of the show by emailing us TNW at twit.tv. What we would really love you to do is to subscribe to our show. You can do that at twit.tv slash TNW. If you have a, a podcast app that you love, just Search for Tech News Weekly and you'll find us. We're, we're in every podcast app. We're also on YouTube. And follow us on all the social medias, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, and if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. And please, if you have any advice for using the Pixel Slate, I, I'm, I'm here for it. So please tweet that at me. <laughs> and send me your iPad uh, tips and tricks to at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to uh, everyone who helps us do this show. Of course, Josh Burke. Jammer B was in here. Everyone helps out. and We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to our awesome guests also for coming into the studio, uh, Jeremy and Father Robert Balasser. It was great to have some in-studio fun. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody.